Hello, we're delighted to welcome you to this recording of an educational session exploring Parkinson's from the perspective of all healthcare professionals. This online event was streamed to an audience of occupational therapists in autumn 2020. The region we're looking at tonight is this autonomic gastrointestinal and sensory symptoms and that's quite a collection of different things. It's quite hard to organise these things into a different subgroups really um, but for the sake of sort of study I've kind of teased them out into these four main sections uh, so we're going to look at those tonight I'm just going to hide that rubbish from my screen um, so thinking about autonomic symptoms so some people with Parkinson's are, are not very uh, troubled in their autonomic systems but I uh, don't know if so you're aware, but, you know, it's said quite often that there are variants of Parkinson's disease. And there is a form where people have a lot more autonomic failure. And they may get just one problem or they may get a, a, a sort of cascade of different autonomic failure problems. So the main things that, that may occur in relation to Parkinson's disease and now particularly in the, the era of COVID, this brings uh, one of those kind of risks in for, for people with Parkinson's getting something like this respiratory virus. Um, and we'll look a bit more on the next slide at, at breathing problems and signs of respiratory distress and what we should be doing about it. But um, cardiac uh, problems is another issue with, with Parkinson's disease, arrhythmias, but also particularly that sort of postural hypertension uh, where people have that sudden drop in in their blood pressure on changing position from either lying down to to standing or or even from sitting after a period of time sedentary and a seated position when they stand blood pressure drops and that can be quite a hazard and then another main um, autonomic issue in in parkinson's disease can be around temperature control um, and and dysfunction of those kind of uh, body temperature regulation systems so thinking a little bit more, I said about the respiratory um, side of things, um, signs of respiratory distress. I mean, we should be aware of these things. It's not necessarily always our direct role, but along with speech um, and language therapists, um, I think often we're more aware of perhaps looking out for these types of problems. So problems around swallowing, um, or around altered voice, uh, difficulties around drooling and the control of saliva, um, signs of, of aspiration, the sort of coughing after swallowing, difficulty with taking food and drink, uh, and weakness of the cough, so inability to expel anything that does need to be coughed. Um, all of those sorts of things are things that we may encounter in our day to day meeting with people with Parkinson's. And now if you're a bit more aware, we need to, to think a bit more about this because it, these are quite important sort of uh, signs. And I think particularly this, this kind of message at the bottom of the screen about vigilance for silent aspiration, where there can be evidence that people are actually um, inhaling liquids and, and foods and not coughing. So things are going down the wrong way and, and gurgling and things. So any of these kind of issues really need to be uh, considered and addressed without uh, too much delay. So obviously sort of a medical review um, can be useful uh, and speech and language therapy as well. So thinking about addressing uh, another one of those issues was the orthostatic hypertension. So um, the postural hypertension, I mean, the only picture I could find of, of anyone having a fall was this rather young man <laughs> falling over the toys caught midair? I don't know how they did that photo. Um, but uh, actually, it tends to be older people who are, who are falling more, people with Parkinson's. Um, but this postural hypertension thing is, is a serious hazard in relation to, to that sort of uh, physical safety. So if we are aware that people are having these kind of events of dizziness on changing position through our discussions with them, and medical reviews is going to be very useful to these individuals um, and in this case particularly this kind of double blood pressure check where, where people have their temperature take uh, sorry their blood pressure taken in two positions both as in a sort of lying or sitting position and then repeated with them standing um, is very important to be able to detect this blood pressure drop um, 
and then medication may be required to, to help if blood pressure is very low. But there are some conservative measures that we'll come on to again in a minute, some non-pharmacological things. But I think particularly um, in relation to people who are working in uh, non-specialist services, but you're encountering patients with Parkinson's, this thing about the blood pressure isn't widely known, say at GP practice level. So sometimes you might need to sort of make that suggestion that they should be looking at the lying and standing blood pressure if you think there's a problem and that the person who's going to be doing the investigation isn't a Parkinson's specialist. In a Parkinson's clinic, this, this sort of thing is kind of the standard, but um, you're not all working within that context, I know. So along with the medical management, there are some non-pharmacological interventions that we're probably all aware of. The kind of uh, taking it in stages, rising from lying or sitting, doing some sort of fake mo movements of the legs, walking movements of the legs before rising, rising gradually and pausing before walking off, um, just to check that the head feels sort of nice and steady and there's not a, an onset of dizziness, in which case sit back down again. Um, but some other advice around postural hypertension is um, along the centre of the screen there is increasing fluid intake and increasing salt intake um, for postural hypertension specifically. And then taking meals in small portions, avoiding large meals, because during the digestion of large meals, that will exacerbate the postural hypertension because the blood tends to pool in the gut area and, and come down from the head and that will add to the, that sense of dizziness and the risk of falls after leaving a, a, a large slap up meal. So that's just kind of a bit of a revision of things you're probably f f quite familiar with. Um, thinking about sensory symptoms, um, there's a variety of things really. Uh, this is where we get into quite this rag bag, as I was saying, of autonomic symptoms. So olfactory dysfunction is, is often basically a, um, a loss of the sense of smell, which can be one of the prodromal or very early uh, symptoms of Parkinson's before motor symptoms arise. And I think there's quite a lot of research now that has validated that in Parkinson's disease, a loss of sense of smell can sort of occur uh, several years before other symptoms. Um, it kind of has a, a follow-on effect into sort of sensation of taste. So often people find that their appetite is affected by the loss of sense of smell. And also things like um, cooking with gas and, and being unaware of, of the smell if, if the gas is, is left on and the flame's gone out. Um, so those are the kind of issues around olfactory dysfunction. I've never heard a patient really complain very much about that. But um, skin issues it is um, a common concern. A lot of people do have this very sort of Parkinsonian dry, flaky skin. Um, they're at a higher risk of melanomas. Uh, skin cancer, um, a melanoma is like a pigmentation disorder. And um, dopamine in the brain is, is neuromelanin. So there's a strong link between skin cancer and Parkinson's, which is um, uh, something that people need to be aware of because they're probably less likely to check their skin and be aware of, of lesions developing. So it's something else we should be aware of. Um, other sensory symptoms, altered and unpleasant sensations. There's, there's something called formication, uh, which is the sensation as if ants are crawling on the, on the skin. Uh, and it's a sensory hallucination. Um, and it can be very unpleasant. It can come with Parkinson's disease, but it can also come on its own. It can come as part of menopause, in fact. Um, this kind of creepy crawlies on the skin feeling, but that can be quite unpleasant. And some people with Parkinson's can get some, some sort of um, distorted sort of delusional ideas around these sensations, and they can start to have sort of uh, anxieties and phobias of having insects under their skin hatching out because there are some conditions where that can happen. There are some African riverborn type creatures that this actually can happen. You can get bitten and then they sort of get a boil and eventually insects come out. So some people get quite distressed about these unpleasant sensations. Um, so that's another thing to, for us to be aware of. And then all sorts of issues around the eyes. Um, 
I'll be coming back to, to the eyes in, in next week's um, session. Um, so I'm going to leave out visual phenomena from today. That's in, in the italics there on the slide. Because uh, we'll come back to that because there's some very odd sort of visual distortions of space and things that, that we'll go into in more detail. But other issues around the eyes are reduced motor function. So in, in the optic nerves, there's dopamine pathways in the optic nerves. And as you know, Parkinson's develops in an asymmetrical way. So what often happens is, is the, the impulses of, of light that have to travel from the back of the retina into the brain for, for processing in, in many regions to create a visual image slows down and it slows down more on one optic nerve than the other. So you can get these distortions of space for shortening and twisting and sloping of lakes that are clearly not sloped. Um, and those sort of things can happen. So you get this reduced motor function of the eyes, you get reduced coordination between the two eyes, and then you can get double vision uh, and all sorts of other problems. Uh, in addition, then we, we know the typical reduced blink rate, uh, typical Parkinson's, which can lead to dry eyes. Um, so people may well need some, some advice and support around those things. And then another eye condition is blepharospasm, um, which sometimes apparently is involuntary opening of the eyes, but I'm much more familiar with people having involuntary closing of the eyes. Um, whether they wake up in the morning, for instance, their medication levels are very low, and they, they have, it's like, um, like a cramp, like a dystonia of the eyelids, literally, that the eyes can't open, although the person's wide awake. Uh, you may not have come across it, or you may have done. Um, pain is another sensory symptom, but we covered that last week. And for those who, of you who weren't in that session, as I've already mentioned, there is going to be recording of that. So we'll leave that for, for deeper discussion elsewhere. But coming to this blepharospasm, this uh, involuntary closing of the eyes, um, in terms of management, I mean, there, there is no um, non-medical management that I've ever really come across. So medical management would, would be uh, botulinum toxin injections. Um, and some of you may well be familiar with patients receiving that treatment about every kind of three to six months. Um, small injections of Botox around the eye muscles can be um, administered by a suitably skilled <laughs> um, doctor who, who would do that as a specialism. Um, and if they paralyze certain muscles correctly to the right amount, there, there may be a, a sort of short-term bruising around the eye from the procedure. But then what they're able to do is reduce the strength of the closing eye muscles so that the opening eye muscles get a chance to open the eyes and it, it can be very efficacious. So that's the medical management of blepharospasm. Um, and again, in, in general practice, if you're working in a non-Parkinson's specialist service, this may be something that people, you know, you, you rarely encounter. And when you do, people will be scratching their heads, not knowing what it's about. And is it a psychiatric condition and why aren't they opening their eyes? Or, you know, it's, it's a very peculiar, very peculiar symptom. Um, but it does all partly, uh, it's drug responsive, so partly medication uh, can relieve it. But when people's medication dips, the, the eyes get closed again. So I, I've kind of culled some ideas from patients about managing this over the last 24 years. So just sharing those with you on the slide there. Um, a few ideas about reducing uh, the impact of the bright light on, on the eyes with visors and caps. Um, trying to sort of adopt a position of, of sort of looking down. And I think a perching stool sometimes is useful in the kitchen to get that downward gaze going. Use that in um, other eye conditions, like with progressive supranuclear palsy, where's that paralysis of the downward eye movements. Using a perching stool gives a tilted forward position and people can see more easily. Uh, another tip there for blessed spasm was around the, the wraparound sunglasses, like in the picture. To, to cut out wind because that can trigger it. And then we move into the sensory tricks. Now sensory tricks is a, is a coping strategy. They, these are techniques that are actually employing uh, brain circuitry to distract the brain from the spasm. So blepharospasm is a spasm of the eyelids. 
and a sensory trick can be employed to redirect the, um, the, the kind of working attention of the brain, the effort of the brain into this other task. And in that way, as a kind of side effect, it reduces the spasm. Very peculiar, these sensory tricks. But uh, patients devise them and they share them. Uh, and at conferences, you get to see little videos of people doing them. Um, so singing whilst walking or reading aloud to enable the eyes to be opened. Um, some people find having a walking stick or a trekking pole um, helps them. And then there's this one about finding the sweet spot. So I've seen this done around the side of the face um, where people sort of do something like they get two fingers and they rest it on their cheek. And by doing that, they can open their eyes. But when they remove the sensation of the pressure of the fingers, the, the spasm of the eyes returns. So these things are short term sort of coping strategies. But um, I heard a very alarming story from a nurse in Cornwall that there's a man who rides a bicycle with leprospasm. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> I, was, I was disbelieving that anyone could do that and I would highly not recommend it. So it, it's a difficult thing to manage, but, but that's a few tips that I've picked up from, from my patients on that subject. So moving on, um, sexual wellbeing and Parkinson's. So in the uh, latest version of, of the OT uh, best practice guidelines for Parkinson's, we've included a section on sexual wellbeing and intimacy. And I think from the point of view of our practice, um, some of the things to be aware of is changes in behavior and hypersexual behaviors. I mean, there, there are some very sad tales of, of people um, whose lives and their relationships and their reputations have been very severely damaged by their response to their treatment for Parkinson's causing this compulsive, impulsive or hypersexual behavior. And um, unless uh, anyone becomes aware of this behavior change and then discusses it with say the one who's prescribing the medication, um, these things can go on for months and years and cause really serious problems in people's lives. People who've brought prostitutes home to the family home, uh, a man in a nursing home who was locked into his bedroom because he was, he was being inappropriate with other nursing home residents and no one was aware that it was actually his medication was actually over, over stimulating him and, and causing some of these compulsive behaviours. So that's something to look out for. Um, and certainly if it comes to your attention, then it needs to be referred back to the person who's um, managing the medication. Um, younger women with Parkinson's encounter quite a lot of problems around their reproductive health and their management of their, their monthly cycle. A lot of young women who take Parkinson's medication notice differences in their, their symptom control and their response to their medication with their menstrual cycle. Uh, and, and quite a lot of young women have, have reported that things get much worse around that sort of pre-menstrual week. Um, so that there is some sort of response there and obviously managing um, those, those kind of uh, monthly um, needs is also quite a problem for people when there's dexterity problems and tremor. So we may need to give some advice and support there. And, and there have been uh, questions around pregnancy and Parkinson's. So, that was something that came up when that first came up, at the conference in 2004. I met up with a group of Parkinson's nurses in Rome, and there was a male Parkinson's nurse from, I believe, from Brighton, who was investigating this on behalf of one of his patients. And eventually, a leaflet was produced by Parkinson's UK. So there is a resource around um, advice for people who are planning to have a family and have been diagnosed with Parkinson's around their medication breastfeeding, all those sorts of issues. Um, so sort of coming back to, to sort of screening for whether there are problems around sexual well-being for your patients. Um, you know, whose role is it? Could be an OT's role, could be the social worker, could be a psychologist, could be a doctor, could be a nurse. Probably no one ever asks these questions in reality. Um, but if you feel that it's something that you want to, to explore, there's some, some advice in the OT guidelines around Parkinson specifically. There's a fantastic um, sex therapist in Israel called Gila Bronner, 
and she's done a series, I think, of about eight uh, lectures on sexual well-being and Parkinson's that are on YouTube. They're really worth seeing if you want to look into the subject more. Or you could just sort of choose one of the sort of uh, the suggested sort of phrases there to, to use as a screening question. And then uh, you may well then be able to offer people a little bit of support in relation to perhaps sort of guiding them towards some counselling, um, giving them support if, if they've got um, a new relationship perhaps and they need to talk to a partner about their diagnosis. Um, and also considering whether a full medical review could be useful at looking around medication issues, um, helping with treatments that can be useful for some of the, the problems around sort of sexual well-being. And then the final bit of, of this session, uh, I wanted to look at the gut. So I'll try and be quick. So uh, this is a controversial question. Does Parkinson start in the gut? So yes, Parkinson's for some people does start in the gut. It's the most peculiar thing, um, but it's been shown in many um, studies now, it's quite well established that long before Parkinson's arrives in the brain, some but not all cases of Parkinson's disease actually do arise in, in the gut. And this relates to the health of what you're hearing probably more these days, the microbiome in the intestines and uh, there's some quite startling evidence to support this and, and the evidence um, and, and the rationale is, is, is actually there. So there's something called the vasovagal axis that's shown in the diagram as the kind of link in kind of red and orange um, running up from the gut to, to the brain there in, in that diagram. And uh, the transmission of Parkinson's appears to track up through that nerve uh, and that nerve has neuroreceptors. And in fact, the gut, starting at the mouth and ending at the other end, has more uh, neurons, brain cells lining it. Its entire length is lined with neurons. Uh, and there's more apparently in the gut than there are in the brain. Um, and in the stomach, there are neuroreceptors, which are like, say, nausea, sensation of nausea that's the bottom of the vasovagal axis. So that, that transmission between the, the stomach, that sense of that pit of nausea in the stomach, that is the bottom of the route through which Parkinson's, through some sort of like um, toxic deposits, it's not a bacteria, I'm not saying that it's uh, an organism, it, it seems to be a chemical cascade of toxins that travels up. And it travels past the heart. The vasovagal axis um, involves the heart. And so this accounts for those we were talking about earlier, the, the, uh, the chest and heart cardiac problems relate to this vasovagal axis. Um, and if you look at uh, some of the kind of scientific side of the staging of Parkinson's disease, there's something called the BRAC model. Um, BRAC was um, a pathologist who did an awful lot of post-mortem examinations. And he... Um, observed a five stage process of the progression of Parkinson's disease up the brain stem into the lower brain, into the basal ganglia, and then out from there. Uh, and it was only at BRAC stage three that the brain becomes involved. So this um, degeneration in, in the spinal column um, and in this vasovagal axis is evident before any motor symptoms of Parkinson's whatsoever. So uh, we'll come back to, to what we can do to, to help the gut uh, a little bit later. So let's just look at some of the other gastrointestinal symptoms. So we've mentioned swallowing difficulties. So around sort of speed, uh, swallowing, we need to be aware about ways to help people with eating and drinking more easily um, and swallowing more safely. So again, speech and language therapy is relevant there. Again, we're, we're learning to, to control saliva and to swallow lip seal, those techniques, um, either OTs or, or speech therapists often are well placed to, to pass on that sort of information. Um, but there can also be issues around weight loss because of the difficulty in, in having meals. Um, so frequent small meals, um, lots of sort of um, nice appetizing meals, we'll, we'll look at some of the food, all those sort of things can be um, enticing foods recommended. Um, and then we need to be aware around the issues of delayed gastric emptying. So that's like a slowing down of, of the gut digestive process. And that's very important in terms of malabsorption of medication. 
helping people with Parkinson's, sometimes there are these dose failures, particularly after a large meal. So earlier we were talking about postural hypertension um, and the hazard of a live, large meal in terms of blood pressure. But also there are hazards in terms of uh, consuming a large quantity of protein, like a Sunday roast um, dinner, um, and how the slowness of the digestion combined with perhaps poor timing of medication where the medication is combined with the protein or taken soon after it, um, this can lead to dose failure so that the dose is not absorbed at all and then the patient sort of has a terrible kind of the rest of the day they're feeling you know very switched off and unable to move and this can be a common cycle that it always follows a large protein rich meal. Um, so the delayed gastric emptying has that kind of repercussion in, in malabsorption because a lot of the oral tablets actually depend on being absorbed lower in the gut in the intestines. So if, if the food isn't reaching there um, very quickly, then drugs aren't, aren't reaching there either. So there's a couple of strategies around dopamine um, uh, and proteins. So quite often, if this is an issue, um, it's worth talking with a Parkinson's nurse specialist if possible, or uh, the Parkinson's consultant, but quite often just simple strategies like having the, the Parkinson's medication at least half an hour before the protein rich meal can be helpful. And then having um, smaller portions of meals, maybe having a pause before dessert, having dessert a couple of hours later for afternoon tea instead of straight after a, a, a large first course, those kind of strategies can be useful. Um, and then um, thinking about there's there's often uh, other sort of problems with the gut and, and elimination. There, there can be problems about bladder function, urgency, frequency. Often that can relate to reduction in fluid intake because of poor mobility and then irritable bladder, as we were talking about with nocturia in the, the first session. So often people need to be encouraged to drink more fluids, particularly non-caffeine containing fluids. And the same relates to, to constipation, which is more common in people with Parkinson's. And again, can, that can be a very early uh, symptom in people that, that starting to trouble them long before motor symptoms arise. And again, it's a link with the gut. So what can we do for the gut? So there's no specific dietary advice for people with Parkinson's in terms of what they should eat for, for being, you know, as well as possible with Parkinson's. But this is the, the latest sort of best possible diet, really, uh, that we could recommend to, to ourselves and to our patients, quite honestly. So along the top, we've got our, our pickles and preserved prebiotic foods, which are all the fashion now. So you'll be seeing in the supermarkets jars of pickled vegetables and kimchi uh, and all sorts of things appearing these days that I've met through through friends who make their own but um, it's quite rare to find someone who goes to the effort because some of these things can take six months to ferment before they're ready but um, this is the kind of uh, dietary advice I think we're all being given is sort of you know um, rich in beans and lentils Apparently in worldwide studies of, of diet to health and longevity, the people who live the longest and have the least depression and the best sort of uh, levels of, of mobility and activity in later life are the people who eat the most beans and lentils. So let that be a lesson to us. <laughs> Thank you for your attention. We trust you found this session interesting and that you'll make time to view other recordings in this six part series. To find out more about Amatha Parkinson's course for healthcare professionals and Amatha Parkinson's app for everyone, visit us online at phoenixarroganeducation.uk.